So our next speaker is Mac Maxwell Hutchinson from the University of Chicago. His thesis is in physics, and he's working under Robert Rosner. And his practicum was at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in 2012. And if I'm correct, this talk is a kind of a hybrid between both your practicum and your research work. Mixed-ish. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll hand it over to Maxwell. Thank you, Carolyn. Good afternoon. Uh, so about a month, a month and a half ago when we were asked to submit titles, this is the title I submitted. This is what my thesis is on, exploring the parameter space of the Leotame Rayleigh Taylor instability. Uh, but since then, our group has had an opportunity to do what I think is a very exciting calculation, a direct experimental comparison uh, to sort of the, there we go, to, to the best, uh, the, the latest and greatest uh, experimental effort in our particular field. Uh, so I decided that in, instead of talking about the somewhat broad single-mode Rayleigh-Taylor instability, we, I would focus on this particular experimental validation uh, and try to tell some stories about the, the interaction between computation and experiment uh, in that context. This doesn't really have a whole lot to do with my practicum, uh, but it happens that my thesis work is now beginning to converge with my practicum a little more. I'm just not talking about it right now. Uh, so before beginning, I'd like to acknowledge the support of the uh, Computational Science Graduate Fellowship and also of Computing Time through the Argonne Leadership Computing Challenge, uh, my advisor, Robert Rosner, uh, and the, the primary development team of the code that I use a version of, the NEC 5000 development team in particular, uh, Paul Fisher and Alex Wababko, both of whom are at Argonne. So I'm going to begin by talking uh, about the Rayleigh-Taylor instability, trying to provide some motivation for why this is an interesting thing to study, even though it probably will come off as being very simple. Um, we're going to make it even simpler, so I'll talk about the Boussinesq approximation, which is what you have to do to the Rayleigh-Taylor instability to turn it from a, a two-fluid problem into one-fluid problem that can be treated with the numerical methods that we use. Uh, I'm going to talk about then a further simplification to the single-mode initial condition, uh, which is nice because we know exactly what it is. Uh, the meat of the talk will be this comparison to experiment, which was performed by Wilkinson and Jacobs in 2007. So I'll start by actually validating our numerical results to their results, and then talk about some advantages that the computational, the numerical form of the data have over the experimental, in particular looking at uh, spanwise secondary flows, something that the experiment wasn't set up to measure, and then extrapolating to later time dynamics, which would involve building a, a much larger and much more expensive experiment. And then I'll provide conclusions. So the Rayleigh-Taylor instability is, uh, I'd call it a primary fluid instability. It occurs whenever the pressure and the density gradients are in opposition to each other. Uh, the canonical case is when you have a dense fluid on top of a light fluid in a gravitational field. The dense, the dense fluid wants to fall through the light fluid. If you were magic and the initial uh, interface was perfectly flat, uh, the light fluid would, through pressure, actually be able to support the dense fluid, but obviously that's never the case. Uh, so the Rayleigh-Taylor instability studies the, the fall of the dense fluid through the light fluid. Turns out that you can get a very similar situation when you have a light fluid surrounding a dense fluid in an explosion, which is the case that you have during, for instance, supernova. Or alternatively, when you have a dense fluid surrounding a lighter fluid in an implosion, as would be the case in, for instance, inertial confinement diffusion. Uh, so if you knew more about the Rayleigh-Taylor instability than you did right now, if you had some magical oracle that you can go and ask, hey, I have this Rayleigh-Taylor instability. It looks like this. What is it going to do later? There are a number of questions that we'd be able to provide better answers to. Uh, so you can read the list and, 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 and pick your favorite. Uh, the most interesting one to us as physicists is the last one. So what is... What does the single-mode Rayleigh-Taylor instability tell us about the self-similar multi-mode Rayleigh-Taylor growth rate? Uh, but there are many uh, engineering applications, uh, again, from uh, natural convection and conventional nu nuclear reactors, inertial confinement fusion, uh, supernova, uh, oceans, double diffusive uh, situations with salinity and, and evaporation, uh, all kinds of things. So the, the state of the theory uh, is that as an instability problem, we, we can look at uh, very small uh, perturbations in the initial interface. So that corresponds to very early times in the simulations of the experiments. And there's a linear theory, which was developed by uh, the, the, the more complete version of it was by Duff in 1962. There are also weakly nonlinear theories where you, you write down the dynamics as some sort of perturbation expansion, which can you know, win you a little bit later time dynamics, but really, you know. Once the interface breaks whatever form your expansion was based on, 
it's no good. Uh, there's an exact potential flow solution for when one of the two fluids has entirely negligible density. So this would be the case of, for instance, a rising bubble of air in, in, in a, a dense fluid like water. Uh, the, the density contrasts basically mean that you can ignore the dynamics of, of the bubble of air. Um, and there, there are some exact results for that, initially by laser in 1955, and then extended by Goncharov to uh, handle cases where the density contrast isn't actually quite perfect, but is still very large. Um, but then when you look at either when the, the density contrast is much more moderate, so when the two fluids have approximately the same densities, and you look at the late time dynamics of those flows, there have recently uh, been a number of theoretical efforts which have looked at computational result, results predominantly and come to very different conclusions about what is going on and what we would expect the even later time dynamics to be. Uh, and the only way to access uh, the actual dynamics of, of the Rayleigh-Taylor instability in these cases is either to build uh, experiments or to do simulations. There, we're really past the point of having any sort of analytical forms. Um, so the governing equations, uh, when you look at the, when you apply the Boussinesque approximation, that basically says that you're ignoring differences in the density uh, in the inertial terms, you're only counting them in the gravitational terms. And then you can take a two fluid problem, which as we learned from two talks earlier uh, this week, are very, very hard and have very sophisticated computational machineries built up around them. And you can turn them into a one fluid problem with an active scalar, which I've denoted phi. And then that active scalar just advects and diffuses around. Uh, the, the simplification to the single mode Rayleigh Taylor instability just says that our initial perturbation is going to look like the product of cosines or the product of sines. It's going to be smeared up by an error function. It's going to be nice and smooth. There are no discontinuities. There are no shocks. It looks something like this, which is kind of boring. So what does it actually look like? These are simulation results of a 3D simulation at a Grashof number of about 10 to the 5. The Grashof number sort of looks like the square of a Reynolds number. So this is below what you would traditionally associate with a turbulent transition. And a Schmidt number, or entirely equivalently a Prandtl number of 10, which is nice in that it's not 1. Um, but it's not, it's not the 500 that Schmidt numbers actually have in nature. So. So on the left, we have the value of, in the thermal case, the temperature. In the formalism I put up before, it would be the value of the scalar. In the middle, we have the vertical component of the velocity. We can see, for instance, that the, the scalar and the velocity basically track each other in terms of the definitions of the bubbles, but there are some differences. On the far right, we have the vorticity. Lots of people tell stories about the single mode Rayleigh-Taylor uh, instability as the generation of two vortex rings. Uh, one in the sort of the, the mushroom shape here in the rising bubble and another in the falling spike. The, the, the boundary conditions here are periodic. Okay. All right, so now that we've introduced, we can get to the experimental comparison. So there's this awesome experiment which was conducted by Wilkinson and Jacobs in 2007. Uh, they had a Let's see if I can, there. OK, so they built this tower. In the tower, they put a, a rectangular tank with an aspect ratio of 2. So its spanwise dimension was 1. Uh, it's actually 78 centimeters. Its vertical dimension was twice that. They put it in, in the top of this rig, and they filled it with two fluids which were initially stably stratified. Then they basically oscillated the corners using a, a speaker system or, or some other oscillator, uh, which set up a standing waves in the stably stratified fluids. They then used an elaborate system of ropes and pulleys and weights uh, to pull this, uh, pull this rig down faster than gravi gravity would have. They exerted an acceleration on it, which was greater than g. That had the effect of, in the frame of the tank, inverting the direction of gravity, taking two stably stratified fluids, making them unstably stratified. And then here on the right, they, they, they took images across the diagonal, and you can see the development of the Rayleigh-Taylor instability. So the nice thing is they, through their setup, were able to you know, force a single mode initial condition relatively strongly, and we can really focus in on the single mode dynamics. Um, so we got in touch with them. Uh, on, in very, very little time, they sent us back all of their initial amplitudes and their initial velocities for actual specific shots that they did with this rig. Ex being experimentalists, they had to do many, many shots, most of which they had to throw out. But we were able to pick basically the best ones uh, and feed them in as the initial conditions to our actual simulation with the real size of domains. So, so the, all of these sizes are in millimeters. And our code you know, can do walls. 
So we have walls on the sides. We're not doing a, a periodic approximation uh, as other people would. Uh, so for CS Jeffers, the resulting calculation, uh, it had 3.4 billion grid points, or 67 million elements, which is the most uh, spectral elements that have ever been used with this code, with five fields, so five times 3.4, you, you can get up to, I don't know, 30 billion degrees of freedom. Uh, on two-thirds of the, the Mira supercomputer, uh, our simulation took 1.5 seconds per time step. Uh, each of the, we did three shots, one with two and a half, one with three and a half, and one with four and a half modes across the diagonal. Each one took about three million hours. And then an extension, which I'll present in a little bit, uh, took four times that long. Uh, if you're a fluid dynamicist, uh, the Grashof number we were able to reach was five million. The Rayleigh number was 35 million. And the results look like this. Maybe. So a couple things to point out. The first is that this looks basically like the images that we saw before, although we get color. We can actually measure the concentration of the fields. Uh, the second is that you can see the effects of the walls. Um, where the modes that are adjacent to the walls sort of end up being stunted. And th there's a known phenomena where when you have a bubble up against a wall, there's a lift force. Um, so we can see the, the bubbles on the sides lifting off of the walls and colliding with their adjacent bubbles and spikes. Um, another thing, so if you, if you focus in on this rising bubble and this, falling, and this falling spike, you notice that they're actually relatively unperturbed. Um, so we can study the, the effects of the walls as a function of wall distance, and it turns out that the, the middle bubble and the spike here are actually reasonably good approximations of the periodic case. So for validation, uh, we have some things that we matched. We have some things that we didn't match. This is sort of the, the money shot plot from the, the paper. We can make our own version of the plot using the particular points that came from the particular initial conditions of the runs that I talked about before. And you can see that the line basically lines up with the points. It turns out where we figured out a, a slightly better way to, to track the interfaces, and we're doing another round of post-processing, and we expect Early results indicate that we should expect for these lines to line up even better. So interpolation, uh, one advantage of computation is that you have the whole full flow field. Uh, so without much additional effort, you can just go through and look for other things. So the experiment only looked at the flow in vertical slices. We can look at the flow in horizontal slices. So the thing that I want to point out here, again, we have the scalar, we have the z component of the velocity, we have the vorticity, we have the pressure. You can see it in both the scalar and in the z component of the velocity. There's some sort of flow which penetrates into the center of the, the rising bubbles and the falling spikes, which causes this weird, you know, the, these little stitching patterns uh, in the z component of the velocity. So this is a secondary flow. If you study flow in ducts and pipes, this would be very familiar. Um, by looking at the pressure field and the vorticity field, we can even identify it as the secondary flow of the first kind, which is interesting because it's a low Reynolds number phenomena. Uh, secondary, the secondary flow of the first kind occurs at any Reynolds number. Okay. Uh, so it would enhance mixing even in situations that you'd expect to otherwise be laminar and steady and smooth. Uh, another thing we can do is just run the simulation for longer. So what if the, the, the equivalent here is if we built an experiment where the rig was four times as tall, that would allow us to get to twice the aspect ratio because these things are basically falling with constant velocity. Um, so we just extend the plot that we had before. One thing to notice is while it looked like we approached some sort of terminal velocity here, uh, we actually continued to accelerate after that brief period. And it's unclear if this is approaching a, a later time higher terminal velocity or stagnation velocity, or if this is actually something linear. It, it, this is sort of the, the, the source of the debate that I mentioned earlier in the theoretical community that surrounds the late time modeling of the single motor Rayleigh Taylor instability. And the point is, in these experimental conditions, if they had just made a bigger experiment, they would have been able to see it. Now, they didn't because it would be expensive. Uh, but the, this, this issue does not only arise in exotic regions of parameter space. It arises in regions which are experimentally accessible. So to wrap up, uh, the first thing is that 
direct numerical simulations that employ the Boussinesque approximation uh, are very good at representing the real results that we get in lab experiments for the single mode Rayleigh Taylor instability. When we do simulations, we have access to full field data. We can take slices of it or apply other operators to it in whatever way we want. And we can glean new scientific discoveries or we, we can learn new scientific things about the phenomena because of that enhanced access to data. Uh, and then finally, now with simulations, you can find a bigger computer and you can run a bigger numerical experiment uh, with much less marginal human effort uh, much more electrical effort, but much less marginal human effort than experimentalists would be able to. Time for questions. <laughs> Thank you.